Hey guys, as always, this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp customized online therapy and listeners can get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash flunches. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash flunches. Here we are at what is hopefully the last of the best of series. I've been enjoying my little bit of time off from the podcast, spending more time with my son. I've been enjoying uh, the Netflix is a Joke Festival. Had some great things. We'll talk about that in the intro. But I can't wait to get set up, get back to work, get all these boxes from up behind me. And so we're setting a deadline. We got some interviews coming. We got some brand new in-person interviews. Go get some new equipment, some new desk. Uh, that that probably all won't be here by next week. But we can get started either way. We're always a work in progress, right, baby? You know how to support me. Patreon.com slash getting better with Ron. If you want exclusive episodes, if you want thank you notes, go check it out. If you want to hang out on Twitch, watch me play video games. I unboxed my Steam Deck today on Twitch. If you just want to hang out, it's where I game, it's where I nerd out, it's where we talk snacks with the Funch Bunch. If you want to be a part of that, Come check it out. Twitch.tv, Ron underscore Funches. Um, the tour, getting back at it. I'm back at it on tour doing stand-up. We've got some theaters. we got the uh, some great clubs, DC Impre- Improv, Gramercy Theater. we got the, uh, we're going to Boston, going to the Wilbur. we got a lot of great things going on. So why don't you come be a part of it? Go to ronfunches.com, check out tickets. Please come see me in my upcoming East Coast swing. That's DC, Philadelphia, New York City, and Boston. So please, uh uh-oh, I did something. I switched. I fixed it. Please come and check me out. I will appreciate that. Other than that, we got Loot, the new TV show coming out on Apple TV Plus, April 24th. All right. No, that's the past. June 24th. (laughs) I'm not good at taking track of my business. June 24th, we got the brand new show coming out. We got uh, that'll be the same day I'm in New York at the Gramercy Theater. So look out for all of that. Other than that. Let's get to the podcast. I hope you're feeling strong. I hope you're feeling brave. I hope you're feeling love. I hope you're grateful for that love. I hope you're inspired by the work that you're doing in this world. I hope you're happy. I hope you're passionate. I hope you were passionate and in finding the things you love. Uh, that's the word of the week for me is passion. Just coming from this Netflix festival, which we're going to be completely honest with you because we honest to it on this podcast. Uh, I was not looking forward to the festival. For First of all, for the most part, I didn't know I was going to be on the festival. Um, I was not booked for the festival for a very long time. Um, I assumed I wasn't going to be booked for the festival. And I was okay with that because, as we know, if you know my history, some people's fucks with me some people don't fucks with me and that's okay and i just uh keep it moving but i got invited to the festival they gave me my own show uh they gave me a a, a showcase with the amy schumer show uh, which was fun because it'll be my first actual having a set on the netflix platform uh so hopefully people will check that out and get to know me a little bit better also amy schumer and i talked about how neither one of us had gotten COVID yet and we felt so lucky and we always try to keep it quiet and not tell people and uh just you know keep keep your head down and then she got COVID and then I was in the same room with her for an extended period of time with no mask on uh and so I was very worried that I got COVID and I would bring it back home to my son and to my wife but fortunately at least knock on wood so far PCR test uh concluded says that I am COVID free I am still negative as one of us has fallen and it was Schumer if there was any one of us who was gonna pass on a disease to somebody else it's probably her that's a quick and easy joke <laughs> it's about sex and promiscuity um <laughs> I love Amy. She's great. It's because it's also interesting. I'd love to get her on the podcast just to see. Because uh, I never met some. I don't know many people who get so much uh, love and 
full on hatred. Like you see these articles where they're like, you, you you see some of these articles about her where you're like, damn, they just want you to hate this lady. They'll be like, Amy Schumer said that she was going to d- drown a baby, <laughs> but decided not to last second. You'll see these articles like this where they're clearly framing her as a as an evil, bad person. I don't and, and just, I didn't ask her about it while we were there because I, I just asked her about uh, the Met Gala because that's what I was interested in. I, I, you know, what was it like to be, go to the Met Gala? Apparently, pretty pretty fun uh i hope maybe we can get her on the podcast i'll ask i'll ask see the worst you can do is that the be- and the best you could do is ask. uh either way i didn't get covid so that was great saw so many great comedians saw uh and it was the first festival that i've been to since the pandemic and just uh it was nerve-wracking i wore my mask a lot i was one of the few people that did which may be one of the reasons why i didn't get covid uh but <laughs> But again, now I'm going to, who knows what the next day or two may bring for me. So I'm just trying to stay positive. Um, but the best thing was just getting back in touch with comedy and having something to work for and to try to knock things out of the park. I got a standing ovation at my show at the Troubadour. And I got to be there with my friends who I really enjoy. Blair Saki, Jackie Cation, Brian Posehn. Some of these people who I just grew up inspired by and loving and watching their comedy and to perform with them and to perform at some of these legendary venues like like the Troubadour and to perform at the Palladium, uh, which I had known mostly from the far side uh, song, Your Mama, when he talked about how he saw your mama beatboxing for Lou Rawls and some bright red boxer draws. And I, from ever then, I was like, the Palladium sounds wonderful. Maybe one day I get to perform there. And I did. And it's beautiful. And I talked to a good friend of mine, Chris DiStefano, who's got a new special out called Special Weshy. You can check out on Netflix. And I just love talking with him uh, because it was more of a balance talking about how having the family, having the son, having the children, sometimes you think it's going to be a detriment to your career. Like you're not going to be able to focus as much as the other comedians or other people, or, you know, insert your industry here. Uh, just that. If you have that family, if you have that kid, you feel like you don't have as many hours to put into your job, to put into your work, put in your passion that other people are going to get past you. Uh, but what we talked about and what I will talk about today on this intro is just the concept of knowing when you've won. Knowing when you got the light that you want and you'll always want more things, you want things to get bigger and better and new experiences and, and new new challenges and new items. And never be I'm never never be ashamed to say you just want some things. I love things on occasion. I love some beautiful things. I want a Rolex rock next year by next year. Uh but knowing when you want, knowing when you've gotten that life that you've desired from when you were 12, 13 years old, 18 years old, 20 year old, whatever age it is when you really decided um, these are the things that I really want in life. These are the things that are important to me. And for me, I was out here doing stand up. I was um, acting in shows, but I would come home and I'd be so lonely. I come home and I eat like just some random shitty meal that I had to find at midnight. Nobody was there to 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 tell me how much they love me or take care of me or be there for me um and then you know and it took a lot of it took some things i didn't even really want to do like when i got full custody of my son i was so scared that that was going to harm my career and that i wouldn't be able to go out and do things because I had to be there for him every day I had to be getting him on the school bus every day i had to turn down roles i had to turn down things that i really wanted to do to the day i get upset because i, I want to do i should have talked to it about because i work with now the, the director but i was supposed to do a role in masters of none that i had to turn down 100 percent because i just couldn't be away from my son and i'm like man i wonder if that would have done some good things for me but you can't live i mean i know I, the bigger regret would have been me not being home for my son <laughs> and I got the things I want. I have the beautiful home. Um, watching the Lucille Ball documentary. Uh, we just put a lot of things in perspective where she said, I have a, I have a beautiful house with a pool and I got a garage that holds two cars. What more can you want in life? And I'm like, damn, I got I got all that shit. 
I got all this shit Lucille Ball wanted. So if I got that shit, I got a wife that loves me and is there for me and is loyal to me and wants the best for me. I got a beautiful, two beautiful sons. I got a career that I love. I got um, the people who I want to fuck with me, fuck with me heavy. The people who I grew up loving and, and, and enjoy. John Stewart came up. I know this. I'm just straight up fucking name dropping now, but John Stewart came up, shook my hand. That is a dream come true for me and that means i've won and there's nothing else more i can really want you know i can't be mad about life i can't be mad about my career i can't be mad about my place i can't be mad that other people are more popular i can't be mad that uh you know other people get hour specials and they don't people don't i can't get mad that they don't ask me to do this the fucking festival until the last fucking minute you know all i can do it's just get in where I fit in, pay my position, enjoy my life. Things change, things come and things go. You're up one day, you're down the next. But for me, I just like to be the same person and fuck with the same people. And that's what, that's really what I want. And when I saw that um, on, on, at the festival, when I see people like Craig Robinson and his band, and these are the same people this motherfucker been working with for 10, 15, 20 years. And I just want that in my career where it's like, I'm not fucking with you because you're hot. I'm not fucking with you because the industry's fucking with you. I'm not fucking with you because uh, I'm going to get something out of you. I like being around the people who I love and respect and I enjoy their mind and I enjoy their company and I enjoy their humor. And uh, when it's like that, it's just easier. It's just an easier life. You get less upset about stuff. You know, who knows? Who knows if I'll ever get all the things I want? Probably not. But I'm going to keep at it. I'm going to keep working. Keep trying to get uh, game shows. Keep trying to work on shows. Keep pitching. Keep acting. And hopefully, you'll continue to have me. Like, as well. Oh, bad segue. <laughs> Let's just get into our guest. He was one of my... Uh, speaking... Oh, good segue. Speaking of people who I just fuck with and who I just enjoy as a human being and just a uh, good, good human beings who create positive, fun, amazing, classic shit. Um, I mean, I've known this dude for over a decade, always been kind as fuck, never let his position, never let his... Um, status change the way he is or the way he acts um and i assume it's because of a lot of meditation a lot of things he's going on and if you're doing that stuff you might might have got a lot of chaos and stuff in your head either way it's one of the best people i know just in comedy outside of comedy it's a great conversation uh last week we, we we went with the other person who we we went with an away game this is the only other away game episode that we have the only other person who i was willing to pack up all my gear and shit and go travel to meet him because he uh because he was worth it and he's a good dude and uh, you can go check out the movie Bad Trip. You know the show on, on Adult Swim. You can check out, uh, he's in a lot of shit. So go just continue to support him. He's a good dude. And check out this classic Getting Better with Sir Eric Andre. Please enjoy it. Am I out of frame here? I'm in frame. Okay, great. I think it's kind of funny sitting here. Got it. How do I look? Let me know if I got shit on my face or anything. All right. I'm, ready. I'm ready to rock when you are. Uh, this mic okay. stand works. Yeah. yeah. Testing. Pa, pa, ta, pa, tippy de ta. <laughs> it's, but it's, I mean, it's so like I'm, a. I'm very, I'm very passive aggressive here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for having us. I can us also hop up when, 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 when you're, you're done eating. Mm hmm. So thanks for having us in your place. It's I'm lovely. doing intermittent fasting. It sucks. Me too. What's okay. your What's your hours? I try to do 11:30 to 7:30, but mm -hmm. I'm I got here late, so I might do 12:30 to 8:30. Yeah. Well, sometimes I go 11:30 till nine, and then I because that's me fucking up. Um, that's fine. You look great. Thank you. How much you. weight did you lose? I lost 140 pounds. Oh my god! You were that big. Yeah. What was your max? 360. Hell yeah, 360, dude. Yeah, man, all the way around. All the way around, baby. <laughs> you see me everywhere I go. Do you ever, do you ever miss the uh, uh, fat Ron punches? 
No, I don't miss the um, health issues. I don't miss um, not being able to buy cool clothes. Um, I don't miss, no, I guess the only thing I do miss is like the pure chaos and fun of just eating whatever eating I want. Eating whatever wanted, you want, yeah. Doing whatever I want. Do you have a cheat day? Do you give yourself, do you indulge on your birthday? Do you have yeah, a... I have a cheat day on Saturday. I usually do a little something, but... What's your cheat? Uh, sometimes my fiance will make me a single chocolate fiance? chip. Fiance? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We haven't Drop seen each other in a little bit. We haven't seen each other. <laughs> you got down on one knee? I did. And classic. Yeah, man. At 11, 11 p.m. At, on November 11th, because we always text each other. We love each other at 11, 11. Aw, that's sweet. And I played the Ed Sh I woke her up. She was asleep. I played the Ed Sheeran song, The Shape of You, which wow, is a song. Wow, you're romantic. And we don't like that song. We don't. Uh -oh. We do not enjoy <laughs> that song, but we hear it everywhere we travel. Every place that we've been, we hear the, either it playing or somebody playing it on a steel drum or so that's an accordion. Your, you're, you're forced to have that be your song. Exactly. And so steel I played drum. it, woke her up, stalled at her, asked her to marry me, and, and she was discombobulated and said yes. So How long have you been together? Been together for two years now. Oh, sweet, man. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to... Um, What's your cheat? What's your cheat? Well, I'm interviewing Meal. you. I'm just care. I'm just making a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> what do I... I love nachos. You what's, Yes, your cheat meal? Really, cocktails are my cheat meal. Yeah, I seen you doing your cocktails every night. It seemed like you're your cheat night. You doing... I took a month off drinking. I'm I'm a, I'm a little over a month. I was up to two hundred five. I'm down to one eighty nine. Oh, that's good. No, oh. you feeling? I gained weight for the Eric Andre show as a joke, so I'm trying to get rid of it. And then and then uh, we wrapped. Then quarantine hit, and I started drinking every single day. So it's time to. How are you feeling? Feel way healthier. Miss junk food and miss cocktails. Mm-hmm. So, life's about balance, though. I'm going to get back to drinking. I just want to, like, curb my drinking so it's not... So I don't have a dad bod. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I get boobs quick. I have, like, a B cup. I had a C cup a month ago. That's one of the things. Gross, I remember man. when I first started losing weight, when the first time I saw you and you go, you were like, no, don't, don't, don't get scared. I know. That's You're the too much of competition. Any, uh, that's the plight of every big comedian. It's like... Would Chris, if you're like, would Chris Farley have been Chris Farley if he was skinny? You have that existential. It's hard, mm -hmm. you know. You, I'm, I'm sure you went through that. You're like, is that part of the, is that part of my appeal? Is that how I get work? Like, do you it, ever feel that way with like your drug usage or drinking? No, I don't do drugs or drink on camera. I know, but I mean, as far as, you know, like with your special and everything, there's like kind of this lifestyle of, I mean, the whole thing's called legalize everything. Yeah. But you you yourself, you don't ever feel beholden to that. Because I know you, that's the thing I love about you is that you kind of portray that, but I, I've never known you to be a party boy of any Yeah, I only really party like once a year. Yeah. I, I, I try to kind of make that point in my special, but I don't know if I made that point. So I'm going to set the record straight right now. Basically, it's more about the war on drugs and how it's completely failed and um it's racist and, it, and it's the war on it's not just the war on drugs it's the war on pleasure and and the root of that being calvinism and a puritanical christianity that um kind of condemns people for uh enjoying the finer things in life mm -hmm. so it was actually less about me and more about uh, Western society, I think. Um, and then it's kind of like an amalgamation of or a collection of some of my favorite drug stories from my past. But uh, yeah, I'm not even a party animal. I'm like a workaholic. Yeah, that's what I didn't say about you. Just to kind of get back to how I start the podcast is I usually start by giving people a compliment and telling them why I wanted them on this show. Yeah. And why I wanted you on the show, Eric, is because I think, um, for many reasons, I would probably start babbling. One, I think you're um, you're the epitome of being yourself. Thank you. And I really enjoy that in a person. Thanks, and man. I love that ever since I've met you. 
Thank you. Likewise, um, the feeling is mutual. Thank you. When I when I first saw your set, you 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 wouldn't even open your eyes on stage. <laughs> You'd be like, I was like, is that guy asleep? I was like, he's sleepwalking. <laughs> and you were like crushing. I think it was in Portland, Portland Comedy Festival. You were crushing, and you looked like you were sleepwalking on stage. It was so cool to watch. <laughs> <laughs> was, yeah, probably very high and full of cheesesteaks at the same time. Yeah. Um, but another thing I really like about you is you're a very thoughtful person. As I mean, from just the answer you you gave about about drug use, you 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 you're a very deep thinker, deeper than I think a lot of people give you credit for Thanks, and bro. know about you. And one of the I tell this story to people all the time when people ever ask me about you, and it's the dumbest, smallest story. <laughs> um, but I remember seeing you at the Bridgetown Festival, and you talked to me, and um, we had met before, and you asked me, how's your family? How's Salem? And I go, oh, shit. Like, this is the only guy that I've met who doesn't just assume because we're in Portland and I'm an Oregon comic that I'm from Portland. He right. remembered where I'm from. Right. He remembered my family. And that always stuck with me. Wow. And um, I'm a hell of a guy. You are. You're a pretty nice guy. <laughs> Thanks, man. And then just from working with you, you know, I worked a little bit on the Eric Andre show. Not very much at all. I didn't do very much of anything at, at all. You, you hung out. You I hung there. out. I pitched some things you showed up. Yeah. that were of opposite of what you wanted to do. Uh, <laughs> I was like, how about we build some things? <laughs> <laughs> Vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, what I learned a lot from you there was, again, not just um, you were the first guy I'd see who would like you run this writing room and then you would like go, oh, I need to go take a break. I'm going to go meditate for 20 minutes. Mm. I never had I never seen someone do that before. Mm. And just also the way that you surrounded yourself with the best comedians like you would just have anybody come in for like a weekend or or wherever they were available whether it was me or Kamel or just the who's who of the comedy community or whoever you like and then you would filter that through your own voice and i learned a lot from that because there's a lot of people who who i think their ego gets in the way and mm. they want to show that they're the chief and they're in charge and you oh, wow. We're very much like, I want to make the best product, and that means I'm going to have the need to have the best minds around me. Mm -hmm. And so that's something I always want. I um, I appreciate you as a businessman in the way that you um, create things. Wow, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Of course. I'm flattered. That's what we do here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm flattered. I'm blushing. <laughs> So to get into to questions, um, also Happy Father's Day, Happy oh, Belated Father's Day. Thank you, sir. Appreciate what did you uh, What did you do for Father's Day? Uh, we just hung out. It was really lovely because again, my fiance. Um, you gonna have any more kids? Uh, we might. We might. Oh, we might. That might happen. Is that an exclusive? <laughs> <laughs> wow. How old's your son? My son's seventeen now. Wow, yeah. seventeen. Yeah, I think first time you met him, he was probably four or five years old. Um, Gosh, but, we've known each other a long time. Yeah, man, for a while. Um, but it was great because I've been, you know, single parent, just me and him for a while. And with his autism, sometimes, like, I didn't feel like making him make me stuff or do stuff. Right. So, like, a lot of times, past few Father's Day, they just come and go. Like, my mom would maybe say something, but nobody said anything. And this was, like, the first year, like, my fiancé, like, had him make a video for me. Oh, that's sweet. And, and make a little picture for me. That's and then we sweet. all... They sat together and watched three episodes of Breaking Bad as oh, a family. Wow. It's a good Father's Day. It was great Father's <laughs> Day. It. It's a classic Father's <laughs> Day. Went on a, it stopped in the middle of what I wanted to do to go on a walk with my fiance. That's classic Father's Day. <laughs> That's classic. <laughs> do you ever think about having a family? Wow, it's heavy. Um, you know what? Kids are a challenge and they are expensive and they are. I'm a little agnostic about it. I, I used to be like, absolutely not. I'm getting a vasectomy. The world's overpopulated. I'll adopt when I'm 80 and that's it. But I have an open mind, you know, I have an open mind. Yeah, I think but, you uh, should just cause um, I'm a big proponent of people who would be good fathers being fathers yeah. instead it's of, intimidating to me yeah it's a I, lot, of course it would force you a, to change it's and, a lot of work yeah. it's a lot of i don't want to do what my dad did my dad was a workaholic and he kind of ignored me for the first 20 years of my life mm -hmm. so i want to make sure that i don't 
Uh, I love my dad, by the way. He's going to be like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> <laughs> I love my dad. But he's very aloof. And he's obsessed with work. So I would hate to do that same thing to my kid. Because I know how obsessive I get with work. So I'd want to make sure... I think this is a transitional year, though. I got special coming out on Netflix and Eric Andre show coming out season five and, and bad trip. I like that. I'm turning a sincere earnest moment into, into, into a plug. Work, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, but, uh, you know, it's a big year. I'm putting out a lot of content. So it's a transitional year. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping an open mind to all, uh, life transitions. Um, well, you talked a lot, uh, I mean, you mentioned twice now being aware of you being a workaholic. Um, and I was walking around your place a little bit before we got started, and it just made me think because I, you know, I remember your old apartment that you had, and um, I just wonder, do you take the time? Because I know sometimes I wake up and I'm just so in awe of that like comedy, that telling that it worked jokes. out. Yeah, that it worked out, yeah. and that I'm here, and I have a house. Yeah. I own a house. Yeah. I have a pool. You have a lovely home. You have the Japanese toilets. Those are my. <laughs> that's my favorite shit. That's how I know you doing well. <laughs> <laughs> I know the MSRP on them. <laughs> Because I looked into him and was like, I got to wait. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it is surreal. That comedy worked somewhat. I mean, I'm not Kevin Hart. I'm not, you know, playing soccer stadiums, but uh, I bought a house. I pay a mortgage. I feel like an adult. That is surreal. Because I lived in that shitty shithole Soviet bunker apartment um, for so many years. And... Uh, yeah, it's surreal. It's success is surreal, and uh, uh, but I'm like uh, happy that it, it worked out somewhat enough to have a quality of life. Yeah, my, my the reason why I bring it up is a little bit is that because I feel like I have that bit of workaholic in me as well. I know I do. I think a lot of us have to be successful, especially when we have freelance type of jobs mm -hmm. and lives that could lead to you just fucking off for most of the day if you choose to. Right. Um, but I just I mean, I think. I one of the reasons I want to come here to, to make sure if you're not aware that you should be aware of the power you have, the, the how well you've done, how not I'm not telling you to relax by any means, do what you want to do. <laughs> but I think if you were to take a look around and just look at the truth of things, you've really accomplished a shit ton Thanks, of man. a lot, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Of course. I just, I fucking love it. I love it when I see you're like the Pied Piper of all these like fucked up little kids <laughs> 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 that truly needed someone to like that showed them that because a lot of it is like they look at the status quo, they look at what the world is and they go, that's fucking bullshit. Right. I'm wise enough to see that. Right. And I see my parents kind of start settle into it. Right. And then they see someone like you who is just like, this is fucking bullshit. Right. And and they flock to it. And I'm, are you aware of, of that? I think maybe I'm becoming more aware. I'm, I'm more aware after um, you just complimented me for it. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're making me aware. Um, but uh, that's cool. That's great. It is great, but I think it's... Um, I'm honored. We, I mean, to me, it's be a little bit daunting in some way, but I guess you didn't even, you didn't think about it. I am, yeah, I'm like, shit. I, I didn't, but I, I guess just I noticed the... it in the way, because the way that you you um, really support Bernie Sanders, and then I saw the way that people responded following you, and I was like, holy shit. Like, people take what he's saying serious yeah i'm like i'm i'm shocked by that too i can't i i, I don't read the comments just because it gets toxic quick so i uh you might know more than me <laughs> <laughs> you clearly know more than me <laughs> i'm trying to not sit profile because i have such a huge sweaty nose <laughs> it's like that steve martin movie roxanne <laughs> <laughs> okay well, well everybody knows that reference we'll transition since you're getting uncomfortable no 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 i'm <laughs> quite comfortable how's this body language is that a comfortable man spread eagle are you happy with your special yeah i'm happy with it 
I'm happy with it. It's hard. Stand up's hard. Stand up is very challenging. So, um, but I'm happy how it came out. I watched it the other night. I watched it at midnight Monday night when it came, when it, like as soon as it was available on Netflix. And, um, cause I had like about, I delivered it like five months ago, six months ago. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, came out all right. Yeah. 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 I watched it yesterday. I really, um, Love the use of New Orleans because that's very rare Great for town. a comedy special. Yeah, um, but for good reasons because it is its own wild shit and it can usually outshine the person that's performing. But for what you do and the chaos that you r thrive in, I thought it was perfect. I love the Big Frida intro. Yeah. I love, I mean, just the whole vibe of it. I was into, um, and also I loved seeing it because then I was like. Okay, well now he has to do new jokes because I saw that that the fucking the I, thing, and I was like, he's been doing that since I, I saw I him. Got, no, that's ago. it. That's like seventeen years of jokes. Yeah. I got no nothing new. You go, I'm you... retiring from stand up. <laughs> <laughs> that's too. It's a pain in the ass. <laughs> got to hang out at the comedy store till one a.m. every fucking like on a Tuesday. I'm exhausted. <laughs> After ten o'clock, I want like a bath. Uh, I feel that way too. That's the thing that's been I've been learning from quarantine is that yeah. like shit. My lifestyle young... and my job is not. It's tough, man. Yeah. So stand up's tough. You got to hang out, mingle, wait for your spot, go up. Me, I'm drenched in sweat afterwards. So when I do multiple spots a night, I'm like, I come home. I feel like I have the shingles. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's hard balancing that with, you know, I'm doing Eric Andre show now, and that takes up so much mental energy and physical energy. Um, when I shoot for 12 hours, yeah, the last thing I want to do is go on stage. Uh, it's just exhausting. Yeah, that's why I commend Schumer and Judd Apatow. They would like shoot for 12 hours. They were telling me they would like shoot for 12 hours and then go to the comedy club at night. And do like three sets. I was like, I'd be dre I'd be sick. I would have the flu. I would like my body would break down. I need rest. I need to like uh, recuperate from the day's shoot. Especially Eric Andre show is stressful because yeah. I'm pranking people and I'm getting arrested and I'm hurting myself. So, um, yeah, but, I'd say uh, that's I commend real I commend them for doing stand up after a shoot day. It's just it's draining. <clears throat> I don't have that in. I don't think I have that in me anymore. I don't think you have to. Yeah. I think you focus on what what you're enjoying. I think for me, too many times you get caught up in like and as you know, I'm a big ass pro wrestling fan. And it's called being a mark for yourself. It's like you get so caught up in like, well, I I need to have a special, I need to do this, I I need to keep up. If I have a special, then I'm supposed to get ready to do my second special or I'm supposed to have my touring material that's different from my special. And oh, and also a year from now I should have another special ready. And then that but I'm like it took me a while to go, who the fuck said this? Yeah. Who, why? Why? Yeah. Why would I do that to myself? Right. For you should do what you should do what feels. I like that Larry David takes as much time as he wants off between Kirby enthusiasm seasons he can afford it more yeah. than we can but um i like that he's just like when inspiration and creativity hits then he goes out and writes more and shoots more and then takes time off like that is the ideal situation to be in i think rather than like pressure yourself to just crank stuff out for the sake of cranking stuff out i think it's um you should do what makes you happy yeah, I think that's the general rule, but it's, I think it becomes difficult. It becomes difficult to turn down money. Yeah, that you think you need, or that you might actually need. Yeah, you know, it's it's a. Uh, I'm not retiring from comedy. I'm just like setting my sights on television and film more than more stand up. <laughs>
Hi guys, this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Life can be a little bit overwhelming, can't it? It can be a little bit much. Must be is one of the reasons why you probably listen to this podcast. And you know, affirmations, positivity, a lot of fun humor, they can be great. But what's even better than that is licensed online therapy from people who are actual professionals and not just me randomly saying stuff. So go, why not check out BetterHelp? They have licensed online therapists that make it so easy to get the help that you need and desire, whether it's for stress, grief, LGBTQ matters, uh, parenting. Like if it's just me and you got a new kid in your household and you got to adjust to the life and the stress that that is, whatever it may be, they have a therapist that can help. And if someone you, you meet with someone and you're not necessarily hitting it off, well, guess what? They make it free and convenient to Switch therapists is be is better than dating. Trust me, and that's also something you could talk about with your therapist. Is how dating is not going well, probably. <laughs> either way you know i recommend it i'm a big proponent of therapy and you can check it out and better help wants to help you today by offering you online therapy that offers video phone and even chat sessions with your therapist you can be seen or you cannot be seen it is up to you it's more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours this podcast is sponsored by better help and getting better listeners get 10 percent off their first month at betterhelp.com slash funches that is b-e-t-t-e-r-h-e-l-p.com slash funches <music> Tell me what, yeah, what's your goals? What do you want to do? That's what we uh, love talking about. Yeah, I got some, you got some projects goals? I'm developing. I, I get very superstitious about it, though. I don't like talking about it until it's actually happening. Well, we I don't, feel like you jinx it. No. Oh, do you believe that for real? I'm weirdly superstitious. I'm the most superstitious atheist I've ever met. That's crazy. I'm like, yeah, right, God. Pfft. Give me a break, and then a black cat walks past me. I'm like, oh! I see a ladder. I'm like, get away from that ladder! Oh, jeez! I break a mirror. Oh no! Seven years bad luck. I'm like, a warlock. <laughs> <laughs> well, and <sir. laughs> thank you. For... <laughs> Thanks, Eleanor. If you want, you can um put it on the ground inside and close this screen door. Thank you, just so the flies don't. Thank you so much. Eleanor is the best. She went to a Black Lives Matter protest okay. as me for me. Right on. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. She's a strong ally. I knew okay. she was a sister. <laughs> well, I don't want to jinx you, even though I firmly don't believe in that. I believe that. I know. It's silly nonsense. It's more. It's it, Some of it's superstition, but some of it's also like. I never liked like the open micers when I was coming up. Mm -hmm. When I was a wee, wee young jitterbug comedian. That were like, yeah, man, I got this going on. I'm doing the MySpace comedy tour. I'm doing it. <laughs> and then you'd be like, okay. And then like it would just vanish and you'd be like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like some, something's embarrassing about it. It puts a burden on your future projects when you talk about them before they're. I have a two minds with that. I never really try to get into specifics because I have found that out that the quieter that I am about a project, usually it means the more truth that it's going to actually right. be created. Yeah, I believe that. Uh, but at the same time, I, I am just more, I love talking goals. So if you want to talk in generals, where, where do you see your career headed? Where do you want to try I to go? I want to live abroad for a little, little bit. Mm -hmm. I want to do some, I want to film abroad. I think like I've always wanted to live outside of America for part of my adult life and no time like the present. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's that. I think, um, yeah, that's kind of what I'm setting my sights on. I'm, I'm looking at London and Paris and seeing what life would like be like across the pond for a little bit. Maybe go back to school and get my master's degree in something because I went to a bullshit music school and I don't really know anything. So um, I love traveling. I travel every year. Um, so yeah just more traveling and projects related to traveling um and uh also just helping my friends make shows i like writing and producing mm -hmm. so um uh any 
comedians that I came up with that need extra help realizing their ideas and turning them into a television show or a film. If there's any way I can help, I love being behind the camera and helping other people um, like create their own shows and stuff like that. So that's the thing that I didn't notice about you and um, was going to lead into another compliment question is that the thing I noticed, especially um, rightfully so lately, is that comedy kind of gets put into these different groups of people. There's always been like black comics, white male comics, female comics, things like that. And then I see even when rooms are celebrated as diverse or celebrated as being different, it's usually like, oh, okay, this is a show where the lead is a woman. So she's hired all women writers and they're all, all women. Like the show's all women or this show's all black men. Mm -hmm. And one thing I really didn't like about you is that I've seen you strongly be proud to be like, I am a strong black man. I like my, uh, other black co-workers and I try to lift them up as well but at the same time you work with someone like Sarah or you work with someone oh you don't seem to show any type of like um like oh they have to come from my background for me to get them like you like right. oh if it's this this is a style that I understand or I like I'm about it no matter who that person is right. and well, I, there's very few Haitian Jew uh <laughs> writers out there so I uh yeah, but I try to just create as much uh, diversity in my writer's room and not just racial diversity, but like thought diversity in my writer's rooms and who I collaborate with. Yeah. Did you say that that's what you didn't like about me? <laughs> I swear to God, then he goes, what I didn't, what I didn't like about you. I was like, shit, is this part of the podcast too? <laughs> no, it's what Starts I Starts like. with compliments, ends with harsh criticism. <laughs> No, I don't know. I could harsh criticize you, but what, no, for what? Don't. What was I going? What am I going to say? I don't know. What would I say? I get it on the internet all day. Do you? No, it's actually not too bad. I wouldn't think so. People be, you can't please, you can't like please you. everybody. Some people that's, do not find me humorous, but that's true. That's fine. That's it's okay. What do you? Um, I kind of want to ask you about like Delia stuff or just the comedy community stuff. Can sure. you talk a little bit about like? Not liking the hangout vibe of it and not because I don't really do that. I've never done that, though. And I felt that has been kind of a detriment sometimes. But now as I get older, I'm like, oh, it's kind of dope that I've just been like on my own doing my own projects because I don't have anyone I'm connected to who, who does weird shit. Right, right. Then I have Guilty to... by association. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, will you think it's also not entirely fair to like any comic that's hanging out in the green room with somebody who's accused of uh, sexual misconduct is guilty by association that's like a little bit it's a bit much but it's a bit much that's what i've been seeing and what made me get i mean obviously it's upsetting for the for the people who were victimized by him but then you get a lot of people going, this is what comedy is. This is what I've always been saying. Just a bunch of fucking predators and, and losers with self-titled jobs who prey on people. And I'm like, that. I'm like, who the fuck have you been hanging out Who's with? Who's saying that? Random people. A lot of people on Twitter. Or, or they think comedians are just all <laughs> predators. Yeah. Well, also a lot of comedians. Yeah. Cause, but it's weird to me because it seems like it's... it's I don't want to paint with a broad brush, but I'm like, you're not talented either way. It's right. not like if he wasn't there, you were all of a sudden up next. Like, right. it's just the people loving to watch some other person fall that I have it. Like, I, I mean, I hate this whole thing. Yeah. Oh, you're saying there's like a uh, competitive yes. slant to it. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, comics can be very competitive and comics. Comics together in a group can kind of feel like high school sometimes. And like there's some um, some of that competitiveness and rivalry and stuff like that. Um, but uh, look, if somebody's fucking children, then, <laughs> then they have. I actually don't know too much about the Delia mm -hmm. uh, thing. I've been so busy with press and I'm kind of like 
all the news I've been reading about everything happening in the world is kind of making me seasick. Yeah. So, uh, I don't really know what happened, but, um, yeah, you can't fuck kids. I know no. that. <laughs> yeah. Was he fucking kids? Well, I mean, I guess technically of their age, yeah, that would, they would be considered still kids. He was yeah. fucking underage g- women? Yeah. Well, that's allegedly, yeah. Ay, Dios mio. Yeah. Well, I guess we should believe in due process and we shouldn't believe in guilty until proven innocent and we should be innocent until proven guilty i guess and uh the court of public opinion is not um the same as the current mode of democracy but uh hmm. that's dark man it <laughs> it's is fucking dark, dark. that's it real is dark. dark uh but to but i don't think it's fair to associate somebody that was like, hanging out with him in a green room is also a rapist. I, I get the impulse. The impulse is that he, other comedians know and their silence is um, unethical. And mm. if somebody knew and was silent, yes, that is unethical. But uh, it's presumptuous. You can't assume that, that everybody that hung out with somebody who's fucking children know. I don't know if they're, if the, the, uh, accused the the culprit is um going around like hey man great set hey by the way i was fucking teenagers the other night at, in the green room you know what i mean yeah um something you stressful. usually keep to yourself yeah. what's that that's something you usually keep to yourself yeah i don't know i don't know enough about it i should read up on it it's, it seems pretty fucking dark though. it was pretty dark <laughs> it was pretty dark and then it's just weird to because, again, I'm a fan of two communities. There's also a similar thing going on in the pro wrestling community at the same time uh, with a lot of wrestlers being accused of sexual assault. But it's kind of weird watching the Uber fans, like the Twitter fans, like the ones in the wrestling are kind of like supporting the victims and the ones in comedy are kind of like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. I think everything's case by case. I think the problem is we make broad sweeping generalizations where Al Franken and Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein are all the same person. Yeah. I don't really know what Al Franken did. I think he did a joke in poor taste, but he's mentioned in the same breath as um, Bill Cosby, who's a serial rapist, or Harvey Weinstein, who's a serial rapist. And I don't think they're the same thing. I think it's case by case. Uh... And there is due process. Not every body accused is necessarily guilty. You know, Absolutely. there's a lot of guilty until proven innocent attitude happening right now. It's a little bit medieval. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's also a ton of fucking rapists out there who are fucking children. So uh, humanity is messy and depressing. And... Um, It's a little bit of both ends of the spectrum. There's actual great political change that's happening via social media and happening via real life protests. But there's also the other end of the spectrum, which is a little bit, it feels like the passive aggressive bullying of the week. Mm. And that's where you get into the comics that you feel are like being competitive or something like that or... uh, I'm not even saying this in the case of Dalia. I'm saying it more in a broad general sense. There's a little bit of... uh, Well, I'll give you an example. Jimmy Kimmel put on makeup and did a Carl Malone impression. Mm -hmm. And now he's accused of being being in blackface or he's dropped an N-bomb during a sketch 25 minutes ago, or 25 years ago. That, I think, is petty. And that, I'm like... Like Bobcat Goldthwait says, we're becoming a nation of finks. Mm-hmm. I think that um, there's blackface is a minstrel show where white people were like, black people are buffoons. Let's dress, let's put shoe polish on our face and show off their buffoonery. 
I don't think Jimmy Kimmel doing an impression of Carl Malone, the guy with the darker skin hue, is um, the same as Al Jolson singing Mammy. Mm-hmm. So to dig up sketches from 25 years ago and recontextualize them, suck any context out of that, and be like, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, I'm going to tattle on you, eh, that is not activism. That is um, the behavior of a petulant, bitter, jealous child, uh, virtue signaling, uh, as if that's activism. Um, It's stripping the bit of all context, um, the morals, and the kind of like what's in good taste in 1997 is not going to be what's in good taste in 2020, and what's in good taste in 2020 is not going to be in good taste in 2050. So to pluck some sketch from years ago, suck all the context out of it, recontextualize it for your own political... uh, social media justice warrying mm-hmm. war, warrioring war, warrioring warring <laughs> i think is um pathetic i think that is it's not actual activism it's um the passive aggressive bullying of the week so i have an issue with that but at the same time on the other side of the spectrum um the arab spring toppled dictators these horrible ruthless dictators Bill Cosby was a serial rapist. Harvey Weinstein was a serial rapist. Uh, these guys are monsters, but we have to take um, everything case by case. I think Bill Burr has that joke where he's like, I'm going to shittily paraphrase his joke, but I thought it was astute. It was like the Me Too movement started out awesome and it was like taking down these monsters. And then towards the end of it, it was like, fuck you, Aziz gave me white wine and I ordered red wine. <laughs> you hit on me one time at a party. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> so I think that um, everything is case by case. And instead of being hyper reactionary in the moment, the more mature, noble thing to do would be wait, get all the information and then make a uh, objective assessment of the situation because um there's a lot of gray and there's a lot of depth i think to each situation they're not all they're not all uh analog absolutely for each other yeah i agree with that completely i believe well a lot of that like cases of like al franken and um jimmy kimmel in particular is like it's a way it's like weaponized outrage right it's used to kind of undercut any positive impact that they could have by pointing at them and go well you you're pointing you're trying to point out our foibles but well look at what you did 25 years ago or look at what you did well also it's um only helping trump it's only disintegrating the left you're only taking down you're only silencing and censoring artists i remember when left-wing people were offensive with their art and their music and their punk rock shit and and it was the religious right always clutching their pearls now everything's on its head now you have the woke police that's posing like they're the voice of righteousness Mm -hmm. but they're censoring artists and art is uh god i saw this post on afropunk that i thought was like one of the best most concise statements about art it was like art is to make the uh something like the outliers comfortable and the comforted uncomfortable. God, I'm not quoting it right. It's like art is meant to make the comfortable uncomfortable and the uncomfortable comfortable. In a sense, I'm shittily paraphrasing that. I'm so sorry, whoever wrote that meme. But um, I don't like that now left. The left is censoring the left. Believing in free speech means believing in free speech for everybody, including those that don't share your opinion. And believing in diversity doesn't mean just skin color. Believing in diversity means diversity of thought. And the left used to be punk rock and used to be offensive. And now it's like the right that gets to be offensive. And I want to take the power back. And I want to, me personally, I want to continue making offensive comedy and be, making outrageous comedy. And I, I never want to censor myself. And um, just because you are offended does not mean you are in the right. Uh, There are people that are offended by gay marriage and interracial marriage. That doesn't mean they were in the right. So that's 
that's I take issue with the woke brigade mm-hmm. um, because it's it's posing as activism and it's not. Um, I but I I side with actual activists and people that are organizing and building coalitions and being like, okay, you know what? You don't agree with every single thing I agree on, but we're down for the same cause ultimately. Come on in, you are welcome. You're not gonna get your anti-racism perfectly right, but that doesn't matter because we're all in this together and we have to build a coalition. That's true activism, um, not um, nanny nanny boo boo on Twitter. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's what you I don't see know. a I'm lot. I'm speaking in broad generalizations too, because when you speak macro, it's different than speaking micro. So it's um, humanity's complex. It truly is, but. Um... I'm just always a fan of being real and what you believe in and that and that is always going to be gray and there's always going to be different circumstances for people and that's another thing that I like about you and what I would say is a difference between um, offensive comedy or comedy with a point and comedy that I'm truly offended by which is lying. Like, which is not presenting who you are or not even presenting the character how it truly is. I can a lot to like Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair. Hulk Hogan was all presented as like, say your prayers, take your vitamins, work out. And what he really was about was being racist and doing steroids and and being an asshole. And Ric Flair was like, I like to drink and party and have fun and do shit. And what was he really about? I like to drink and party and have fun and do shit. And that's what I I like with you. You're like, this is who I am. I think Ric Flair's like a hardcore right wing. I don't well, think he is. Yeah, yeah. Is I, think he? He, I think he's super duper right wing. I don't know. I think I've he never read, heard that in my yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, how but, did you? What did you hear about? I watched. This? I, I I worship Ric Flair, and I read up about him, and he's like, I think he lives in North Carolina, and he beats the drum for all the Republican politicians in North Carolina. And d- double check. I, I apologize for the Flair family if I'm getting that wrong, but I wouldn't say he's a perfect man. But also, no, whoa, no, 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 not like, a perfect but, man. But I, I'd also you brought up a good point. There's also good and bad in everyone. Yes. And he who is without sin cast the first stone. Um, humans are complex. Humans are walking contradictions. I'm really, I'm agnostic about humanity. I'm actually, I'm bummed about certain aspects of humanity and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm I'm inspired by other aspects, but well, let's anyway, talk about I'm, I'm what talking inspires like very you like right vague now. What, what inspires you? I'm inspired right by now. the Black Lives Matter movement having the largest turnout in civil rights history. We have a law now named after Breonna Taylor that banned no knock warrants. They're banning tear gas in Seattle. The four officers that arrested George, that, that murdered George Floyd are arrested. Even if two are out on bail, they're still arrested. They still have to go to court. That's that's real change. That's huge change. People are toppling Confederate statues. My whole childhood, I was like, why are these statues still up? When I would go through the South, Mm -hmm. my mom, I'm like, why are these statues? These guys lost. The Confederate flag is a flag of treason. They were seceding from the Union, and they lost, and they fought to keep slavery alive. Why are they commended anywhere? These guys are monsters. So for the first time, I'm seeing my generation and the the younger generation topple those statues over. That's that's pretty, I don't know, uh, significant. It's a significant symbol of... Um, progress, you know, so, uh, and, and, and toppling over to Christopher Columbus, Center because Christopher Columbus killed three to 8 million Arawak Indians brutally Ch- dismembered them, raped them, had the dogs eat their intestines out while they were alive, killed babies. I mean, he was a monster. So I'm really inspired by the youth culture right now. And I think that, um, we're, we're hitting a, we're hitting a tipping point. Um, where people have, are fed up with the current president and the, the, and his administration and his racist agenda and white nationalism. Uh, it's just like disgusting the way that, you know, there's all this darkness in this country. Um, people are fed up with it. And then you're quarantining us because you didn't prepare for the coronavirus properly. You ignored it because you, you're a pe- petulant, Trump's a petulant child, trust fund kid who... Uh, doesn't want to deal with anything harsh. He just wants people to compliment him. 
and now we have the highest death rate in the world and no end in sight, you know, so it's like a powder keg. People are just erupting, but erupting in the best way and people are really active and it's really exciting to see. I agree with you because as much as you talk about the woke police, I feel what's been truly inspiring me is to see people become truly awake. Yep. To to look at things and have their eyes actually be open to have as small as it is. And, as you know, I've celebrated Juneteenth since I was like a kid or at least an early teenager. And to see my peers or white people posting about it, even because as part of you, like, oh, well, now you know about it. But to be like, you know about it. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. And that's so exciting to yeah. me. The, um, especially because the thing that had been irking me a lot in comedy and, and thereby throughout society is this like generational hatred towards like Gen Z millennials or whatever. And it's just like, to me is the ultimate like tables turn that when shit starts to actually go down, who's in the street, who's actually yeah. doing shit, who's actually getting shot with rubber bullets. It's the kids. Yeah. I was really impressed. I was impressed with the kids that were, up like on Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the president's uh, in front of the White House, shaking the cages, crawling on their knees with their hands up towards riot cops, taking bullets and tear gas and pepper spray to the face. Like that's noble. And they're doing it for a cause and they're making real change. And they're showing that this authoritarian regime is barbaric and not us. And we're the reasonable ones. So it's, um, it's inspiring to see. I, what, what makes me sad is that I think Mark Zuckerberg is a sociopath and he's just allowing misinformation to fester on his uh, website and um, instead of taking charge and, and doing something about curbing the misinformation. And uh, I, also do, I also think that the working class were pitted against each other. It's like everything's Republican or Democrat liberal or conservative but it's like the billionaires win when we fight each other i think we should find common ground and learn to come together and rise up against the oligarchs that are controlling us we're, we're being pitted against each one another i think there should be more common ground and unity yeah i don't see how you could disagree with that if you look around in any way and just see at, uh, who who things are blamed on all the time, you know, especially when I was a kid, all the commercials about black guys coming in your neighborhood to rob your neighborhood. And then there's a lot about Hispanics coming to take your jobs and then we got to keep Muslims out of the country. And it's the whole time. It's just a game of misdirection and look the other way. And then you also, I mean, particularly with the coronavirus and this lockdown, you look at the businesses that still survive and thrive and the ones that are going under and it's like a clear like they're attack on the middle class on tackle on, on the, the last bit of mom and pop that have been able to survive yeah and i don't like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean uh watch my comedy special legalize everything everywhere june 20 <laughs> every interview i've done mm-hmm for this round of press has been so dramatically political because of the times and mm. it's totally organic and I'm totally cool with it, but I'm not used to being so overtly political it, back to back to back to back press. It's well, really, you didn't it's really have interesting. to in this one. No, I, I know. I'm not, and I'm, not, and I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining at all, by the way. Mm -hmm. I'm I just don't finding... even think you're special is political. You were doing those jokes already. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's I, what I was like because I saw a lot of the reviews and they were like most timely. I was like, he's doing those jokes five, six, seven years oh, ago, seventeen years ago. I I some didn't want to shit talk and say that <laughs> once. Some of them, <laughs> some of them, but some yes, of them, as some David Tell would say, some some of these jokes are so old they can vote. <laughs> um, uh, that cops one you've been doing forever. Yeah, and it aged like fine wine. Thank God. So uh, that was pennies from heaven. I mean. That was just serendipitous timing, but um, yeah, yeah, and I don't, yeah, because absolutely, I don't, I, I don't want to get misconstrued. I don't mean it as any disrespect. I no, think I it's pretty it. fucking awesome because so many people chase what's going to be in the zeitgeist, and you 
sticking to the shit you've done your whole life than the things that you that meant to you when it came out put you in the zeitgeist yeah and to me that's that's what art is thanks man yeah man you know i love you, you know, man i love you too man you know what um it's interesting about like court of public opinion and all that stuff we were talking about chelsea Brady said something very smart to me she goes she said something i'm paraphrasing what she says she probably doesn't even remember saying it sorry i'm putting you on blast chelsea she said something to the effect of like i was talking about how we're a puritanical society founded by the pilgrims that it's very easy to us to put people in the stockades and throw tomatoes at them but we're not a buddhist society we don't practice forgiveness and she goes she said something i worry we're becoming a society that doesn't practice forgiveness and i was like huh never i don't know just the way she said it was so poignant i can't even remember what we were specifically talking about but um we are not a buddhist society <laughs> <laughs> we're gun toting whiskey drinking society founded by the puritans it's a lot of eye for an eye yeah i guess my point is i wish i I wish we could, I, I like seeing that we're building coalitions and the working class people of all different colors and creeds are coming together because I don't think, don't let media corporations and billionaire oligarchs pit the working class against each other. I think we gotta come together and find common ground and, and help each other grow and help each other out. And, I'm running for president and I want to heal America. I can't endorse it, uh, but I better than what we got. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to take back because you talk about it being political. And I the thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is just how the, we've reframed human rights issues and things that, as political issues as if there could be sides. And I think that's been one of the biggest tricks that they've been managed to do is is putting women's health issues, racial issues, things like that, things that are human issues, and then framing them as political issues. Partisan issues, yeah, that's that's the that's the problem. It I is. mean, like, why is global warming even political? We all live on this earth. If it cooks there's no vegetables. If there's no vegetables, there's no animals. If there's no vegetables or animals, there's no food and we all die. What's it matter if you're Republican or Democrat? If we cook the earth, we die. We're not going to move to Mars. It's like, why is that political? Why did that become partisan? I know why it always comes down to money and corporate interest, but, uh, let's like come together on that. There's one earth. This is where we live. We got to preserve it. That's not political at all. It's just life and death. If there was an asteroid headed towards Earth, you wouldn't be like, well, I'm Republican, so that asteroid's a hoax. You'd be like, shit, let's figure out how to get, what, what do we do when this asteroid hits? And that's kind of what global warming is. Why is it political? Yeah. It's not. We're so going to die the, if we what cook COVID the earth. is and, and still has become political where people yeah, why is COVID? are saying it's a that virus. their masks will kill them. I don't, yeah. So, not everything's political, but people force everything to be hyper partisan and it's destroying America. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Tell us I, about the movie coming. <laughs> uh, so, you know what? It's a wacky feel good comedy. <laughs> um, yeah, we're putting the movie out on Netflix now because the uh, world ended. So, Netflix you have a date the, for that yet? No, we're trying to ask Netflix. Please somebody call Netflix and ask. I think they're, I honestly think they're seeing how well my special does and mm -hmm. then they're going to give me a day. They're like, shit, put them on after the second Epstein documentary. <laughs> <laughs> give them the graveyard shift. Um, no, I don't know. We will we will find out soon. I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah. Excited to see it. Yeah. Sounds fun. Thanks, man. Yeah. You were in it, Lil Rel, right? Yeah, Tiffany, Lil Rel, Tiffany's Tiffany in Addis, it. Yeah. Yep. There you go, Black Elite. Love Black it. Black Elite. I love it. Yeah. <sighs> anything? Anything else? No. We said it all. 
Yeah, pretty much. No, I have my regular end, and I'll get into that. What is it? For sure, but I wanted to ask you. Oh, you want to end now? You no, want to go no, right no. End in? no, 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 no. Okay. I'm just curious what the... Well, I'll tell is you it when a spectac- we get there. Is it like, does no. it glitter? No. Oh, okay. No, no. <laughs> I'm thinking like candy, warheads. No. Airheads. Oh, it actually reminds me I'm glad that we stuck because I, I would have forgotten something. Um, a, I'm just glad to be here because I really do. I just enjoy being around you. I enjoy Thanks, your spirit. Man. Thanks. And I taught this to um, to Mike when I saw him. Um, or I, he did the podcast. Um, that usually when I see you, I usually run into the two of you a lot together, uh, Mike Rosenstein and, and you. Um, it's just that it'd always be like coming from a flight or or headed to a meeting, and I was like, man, whenever I run into Eric, it always makes me feel good because it makes me feel like I'm headed in the right direction because <laughs> it's like he's leaving a meeting, I'm going into a thing. I'm like, oh, cool, like I'm I'm following, I'm doing I'm going around, you know. And I want. That's where you're terribly wrong. I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah, but neither do I. (laughs) I'm running around in circles. Oh, I'm not trying to copy you by (laughs) any means. Nothing. What the fuck? I'm going to run around and break some shit. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to think like that. Um, (laughs) Another thing, I want to make a confession. One of my favorite stories that I never talked about before. Um, I went to one one of your birthday parties back. Like earlier, like back when in your apartment, I think you were getting ready to leave your apartment. You had the petting zoo, yep. you had the Santas, you had a lot of things going on. You had a lot of d- different products to try. Um, I was already high on mushrooms when I showed up there. <laughs> and um, yeah, there's still the little bitty tiny apartment complex and there's like a big line for the bathroom. As soon as I get to your apartment, I'm like, oh, these mushrooms are acting up. Like, I'm oh, no. having troubles. I'm having troubles. And I'm there on a date with a lady oh, and everything. No. <laughs> and so I wait for a line for the bathroom. And I get in the bathroom. There's like this tiny log. And then I realize like, oh, this is going to be horrible no matter what. Oh, fuck. No matter what. And so I was like, as soon as I open this door, I'm just booking it. I'm leaving. And it was like a movie. So wait, wait, you barfed in the toilet? No, I took a big old dump in your toilet. Oh, you took a dump. Okay. Big old, but it was like. It was, it, it was a showstopper. It was a showstopper. Uh-huh. And then as soon as I opened the door, it was as if it was. I mean, also I'm high on mushrooms, but it was also as if it was a movie because there was a woman who who was who was very she's a very big gal not you know <laughs> not that it matters for the story but it matters for the visual yeah of I like because like if you were casting a movie you would yeah. been like yes i want you yeah, yeah uh, and so as it. soon as i open the door i just see her face and she just goes oh my <laughs> god <laughs> <laughs> And I just left your party. You just took off, <laughs> never to return. I would have done the same. I would have been like, that was just the shit of the century, and I just have to leave. <laughs> I, I should like shower after that shit. Yeah. yeah. Was, uh, but I always like, that's a, that was one of my f- shameful but most fun. T- but also because I was on mushrooms, I had no shame. Yeah. I was like, this yeah. is funny. You were just like, bye. <laughs> yeah. I'm out. <laughs> I love that. It was great. I love that. Oh, but okay, that was really it. That, that, <laughs> and then shit, now I got shitting on mushroom story. Yeah, I wanted I to tell it. you that just in case you I didn't appreciate know. A good shitting on mushroom story at your house, uh, <laughs> in your bathroom. Um, and I'm then the last thing that we ask is the first thing we ask every guest, and that's just for just a little piece of advice for something that maybe you've been chewing on, thinking about, that's been helping you get better, that you can share to our getting better audience to help us get better. Get, get, give advice or ask for advice? Give. Give? Uh, I say always trust your intuition. I say if you want something, sorry, sorry to speak in platitudes and maxims, but uh, if you want something, work very hard. It is. It, it truly is 99 99% pers- 1% pers- inspiration, 99% perspiration. I believe in that. And be kind to yourself. You can push yourself, but don't be mean to yourself. Say positive things about yourself and nourish yourself. Um, yeah. Life is short. Life is also long. Don't be a dick to yourself. That's beautiful advice. Yeah. That encompasses a lot of what we try to do, talk about in this podcast. And I just, again, 
I just like you as a person, first and foremost. That's what I really care about. But as a comedian and as a um, the way you carry yourself, I just love how you represent comedy. Thanks, man. I love how you're, again, always yourself. I love how you... Um, I mean, I know that's stupid, but just even dumbass thing. It's like, oh, he's just dating Amber Rose or he's doing things. And I know that means nothing, but to me, I'm like, that's big for comedy. That's huge for he's us. He's doing it for us. He's doing it for the stand ups. That's right. Get out of here, rappers. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank I you. Love I love that. Flattered. I love that shit. Cause I love anything that makes comedy look bigger, bigger and better. And and you're kind of right there on the forefront of making things look cool, being your fucking self, and uh, being positive as well. And I love that shit. Thanks, so, man. man I appreciate, appreciate you. It. Appreciate thank, you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, man. Thank Thanks you for having, having me. Yeah, you know what? I'll leave. You live in my house now. Okay, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> You go live in my and house for a little bit. Here, we're going to get, oh, you guys are violating. You motherfuckers. Let me show you something. We mapped this shit out. Look at this. Because anytime I don't wear a mask in a video in my own house, I get shit. Look at this. Six foot to the T, you fucking cocksuckers. I hope you hear that. Yeah. We're responsible. Okay. <laughs> take that. <laughs> Internet. And take that. Coronavirus. What if I got coronavirus from the uh, tape measure? <laughs> oh shit, I put a little bit of the virus right at the six foot mark. Um, Whatever, I just wanted to end the podcast hostile as soon as I possibly could. Thank you, buddy. Corona handshake. <laughs> Love you, dude. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, please check out our last episode right over here. Bam! Or perhaps a video picked by our overlords at YouTube. Boop. And don't forget to subscribe. Hit it up. Hit it up. Press the button. Press it.